Hello, Horasis Extraordinary Meeting. My name is Heidi Kupari, and I am joined by some extraordinary people to talk about the changing future of work. I am joined by Ruben Atepke, Andreas Ermen, and Ryan Zafar. We have a few other panelists who are, uh, despite all the testing, are still having some tech challenges. So let's send them good energy that they can get on soon. We're going to go ahead and get started. And if they come on, we will we will just flow. Uh, I hope everyone's been enjoying this meeting so far. For those of you who have been doing this, uh, here I'm in Colorado and uh, the United States. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic today. So my background is impact investing and social entrepreneurship. Uh, I have been working with aligning money and skill sets with impact uh, for about 16 years. And so why I'm moderating this panel about the future of work it, it, there's a lot of different reasons why I'm very interested in this. I would call myself a technology futurist and also a launcher of green money and impact. And what that means is that we are going to see that the future is something that we all really want to have and that it's something that we all dream about. And so I work with youth. Uh, I think they are the, uh, the future. Uh, to me, they are of work and that they actually have skill sets right now where they can start to design their own careers at a very young age. So I've been working with as an social enterprise that I started as an answer to something I saw missing in the world, which was that youth uh, outside of school were very interested in technology, entrepreneurship, innovation, but they don't have a lot of platforms for that. And so we started Dream Tank uh, with a community here in Boulder, Colorado, and it's now expanding globally. And it's really exciting because young people really seem to need some, some hope and dreams, especially now. Uh, so I've seen the future of work changing a lot in the past year, especially since COVID. But I, I have some incredible panelists here that uh, are going to talk about this. Now, uh, when we talk about the future work, this is a little bit of a controversial topic. Uh, you know, robots, uh, these uh, sci-fi movies that show us that, uh, you know, these things can go wrong, right? Uh, and But there's a lot right about them too. And a lot of, a lot of research shows that it may not be as doom and gloom as we think. It is uh, it is going to have some challenges and it is right now with jobs and changing jobs. Um, however, I, I happen to think perhaps this could be a platform for people to learn new skills, to do something more that they love than something that they just need to do for money. So um, that's my optimistic view of the future of work. But I want to hear from all of these amazing people on the call. And I've asked each one of them to start off with a two minute intro with a personal story of them or someone in their life that demonstrates how they feel um, and what they think about the future of work. And after the two minute intros, we're gonna go deeper and pick up some the themes and talk about what do they see in the future, 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future with the future of work. So I'm gonna start off with Ruben. Uh, Ruben Atepke is the executive chairman of the merchant company of West Africa and Ghana. Um, and so Ruben and I had an incredible conversation yesterday. And uh, I woke up this morning with a beautiful gift in my inbox, which was the resume of this young man, 22 years old, who you've been mentoring, Ruben. So I would like to hear about the story of David, Atem, and you. Over to you. Great. Ruben, I can you hear me? Everybody from a sunny. I can hear you now. Can you hear me as well? 
Uh, yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead and start with great. your two-minute intro story. Okay, so the story I was telling Heidi is that about 10 years ago, I met a 12-year-old that I kind of adopted, adopted as in friends. We went to the Accra, because that was his first visit in Accra, and we went to the ocean together. And it's incredible when someone who has never seen the ocean sees it for the first time. He just stood there for about an hour looking in amazement. Now, fast forward, 10 years later, I was saying last week he graduated with a first class in computer science from our leading technology university here in Ghana. The irony is that five years ago, he did not even own a computer. I brought him his laptop. Now, the CV I shared with Heidi shows that he's won even Google Awards. He's been to Google in California, all within the space of five years. And that shows that even out here in Africa, there are super brilliant people that just need to be given the chance and they will be fully integrated into the most high tech of things. So that's my intro story. Beautiful. And you still have a little bit of time. Uh, so do you want to add something or give some more time for our, our back and forth later? Good. Later, okay. if that's later. fine. Wonderful. Wonderful. I love hearing that story. Uh, it's, it's incredible to see. Uh, so the next speaker I wanted to invite start is Andreas Ermen. He's a professor of economics at the University of Luxembourg and much, much more. So, Andrea. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Heidi, for your, uh, for your introduction. I also uh, agree that the changing future of work is a fascinating uh, topic to, to think about. And I want to start telling you um, a little bit about, maybe it sounds a bit mundane, but uh, the moment where my personal future of work changed, and that was only last April, when my university switched to full remote teaching for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. That was quite a challenge. The first thing that we noticed was that uh, our university was extremely well equipped, both with software and hardware, to manage this switch. But me and my students, of course, had to learn how to work with, uh, with this new software. So an effort both from the, let's say, the supplier, myself, and the client was necessary to get this done. Uh, I also had to adapt my pedagogical concepts to the new situation. You know, teaching kind of 70 people on the computer, suddenly you don't see them um, anymore. You essentially talk like, uh, like being on the radio, right, to an audience that you can't see, which is quite, uh, which is quite a challenge. But of course, also my students um, had to adapt to the new um, to the new situation, you could no longer raise your hand and spontaneously ask questions. There was a chat function where you had to type your questions. I mean, and you're a little bit more reluctant to do that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, so that was that was quite the uh, the change in the future of my work um, environment uh, last April. Um, I think overall it was a fantastic experience. Uh, because we realized uh, new opportunities, both myself and my students, um, the new opportunities that uh, were hidden hidden so far, right? I mean, they, suddenly um, we became aware of the, uh, of the possibility of the new technologies. Um, it is still a second best mode of teaching, right? Not as good as in-person teaching, but of course superior to a shutdown of the universities. So my students could attend, learn, and pass their courses Meaningful grades could be given and students completed the programs they were enrolled in uh, on time and as planned. Wonderful, wonderful. That's a great story about something that happened through this crisis. Uh, okay, so next I would like to invite Naeem. So Naeem Zafar is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Telesense. Uh, and he's also a faculty member at UC Berkeley, and he's also a fellow Brown University alumni. Um, so uh, we found out that we had 
had um, that in common as well. So Naeem, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. I was uh, actually born in Pakistan and came to the US to get a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, and been living in Silicon Valley. That's what I'm speaking to you from Silicon Valley, California, Cupertino. Uh, so I think the future of work, the way I see that is we have gone through several transformation. I mean, with the steam engine and with electricity, with computers, we are entering yet another phase and some organism will adapt and some won't. So what is the future of work going forward? Because many things which could be done more efficiently by artificial intelligence and robots will be done that way. Some profession will be obsoleted, like accounting, even basic legal thing, not the fancy. So things which require complexity, things which require empathy are not going away. But many things which are repetitive are going away. We have seen that today. You know, brick layers in a third world country will still be laying bricks. But in, in the developed world, you won't see that. It's been automated. So the question is, what are the professions which require empathy? What are the professions which require complexity? When you have to integrate myriad components to define what to do, like management, like being a CEO. So I think to me, it's very interesting the transformation we're going through. The question is, are we preparing our students with the mindset, are we giving them the entrepreneurial mindset necessary to be able to survive? I'm on my fourth profession. First, I worked as an electrical engineer, then as a marketing executive, then as a CEO, and now as an educator. So this has happened not because I was trained to be an educator, because we had the entrepreneurial mindset and able to adapt. So question is, are we? do we have the entrepreneurial mindset? Are we teaching that? If not, we are ready for a rude awakening in the next 10, 20 years. Wow, that was perfect time. It was literally two minutes on the dot. Uh, yes, that's a really important question. We're going to get deeper into that for sure. I have. I know that a lot of people on here probably are parents or know people uh, that have children and know what's happening right now with the online schooling. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Next, we have Luca Vicentini, General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation uh, in Belgium. So Luca, welcome. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Go ahead. Okay. So I would like to tell you about uh, a couple of meetings I had uh, before and after the COVID lockdown with workers. And in particular, two workers. One is uh, a worker from Poland that works in the car industry, in the automotive sector. And uh, this worker uh, faces two big challenges for the future. The first one is, uh, will uh, cars that uh, where the engines uh, run with diesel or uh, gasoline, uh, uh, and uh, on the other side, uh, will these cars survive in the future, or will they be completely replaced by electric cars that we probably, everybody hopes, but at the same time would imply an enormous disruption for his job. And on the other side, whatever will be the future when it comes to automotive sector, uh, if uh, automo aut automation is introduced in his factory, what will be about his job? So it's clear that for this worker, the future of work should mean the possibility to keep the job, not only to be equipped with new skills to face these challenges and transformations of the future, but also making sure that the economic system, the social system around, the institutional governance will make sure that this transformation will not leave him apart. And the other worker that I've met is a worker working in a platform, in a digital platform in the, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, this worker is very young, is very, very high level skilled, but at the same and so enjoys uh, very much his or her own work, uh, but at the same time doesn't have any bargaining power to set his income or her income. 
he or she doesn't have any real possibility to get access to uh, social protection systems or unemployment benefits if the COVID, for instance, blocks completely his activities, and he or she doesn't have any hope to have a pension at the end of his or her career. Uh, what I mean by saying that, that these two workers, these two categories of workers uh, have enormous fears about the future, while at the same time they enjoy fantastic opportunities linked to their own specific uh, job. And we, as the trade unions, need to provide answers to these people. And this is our challenge when it comes to the future of work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luca. That's really important. Uh, yeah, so all right, so we're going to go a little bit a little bit deeper now. Uh, so Let's go into uh, a few words that I heard that I, uh, I, I picked up on is empathy being part of the future of work and uh, the innovation that came from going online in university, the impact on a young person when you gave them technology, and the challenge of uh, two people with different jobs in the economy. Um, with all of those said, Let's let's go just right now. Let's go three years into the future, and uh, so and then we're going to go twenty years into the future. Okay, so going three years into the future, I would like to just have a comment from whoever feels that they would like to share about this. Um, three, make a statement or a prediction. Three years in the future, uh, and you can do like. Um, I a dear friend and our advisor and council member at Dream Tank, Salim Ismail, who's a, a founder of X and originally one of the founders of Singularity. And he has to say, are we going to end up with, are we going to have Mad Max or are we going to have Star <laughs> Trek? So, so, what direction do you see in three years, depending on the things that we might be able to do? Do you think? So Heidi, we didn't, I did not understand because the audio was distorted. You're asking for a comment on uh, what the future of work is five, five years, 10 years, 20 years out? Three years and then 20 years. Okay. So from could, my could perspective- we, could, we, could, could we just um, say that if you don't speak, please mute your mic. Please mute your mic because that's the source of the distortion. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I think uh, uh, Ruben has muted now. So point was that w the the way we work, the way we create output is changing. So our parents had on average three professions in their life, three jobs. The generation coming after us, research says they'll have 21. So which means that if the issue is not getting a job in 95, issue is you'll be a specialist. In certain industries, like movie industry, very few people have a full-time job. You do gigs. You work on a movie, then you work for the next movie. Same thing in theater. Same thing with surgeons. Most surgeons are independent thing. They, they have an affiliate. They do a procedure. That's going to be the future of work for most people, which requires a different way of engaging, working, making money, so long term, you'll see a big bifurcation. People who will be on the understand this can adapt to this, and people who don't have digital access, don't have access to the laptop, like Ruben story or the internet, and there'll be bigger divide between haves and have-nots, and concentration of power because of concentration of information. So future of work is could be very scary or very interesting depending on which side of the divide you are on. Yes, hence that it almost sounds like it's like the Mad Max versus the Star Trek. Uh, Andreas? Yeah, I think um, one of the, the, the features of the, the changing um, future of work that we experience uh, is part of my, my own uh, example, uh, namely that uh, home office work. 
will increase or has tremendously increased due to the pandemic. I mean, that has been a, a real option for quite a while, but um, uh, both workers and employers were quite reluctant for different uh, reasons, probably to implement it. But during the corona uh, pandemic, the, the reference point uh, abruptly changed because uh, employers essentially had a simple choice, find ways for workers to do their job safely or to shut down. And suddenly, um, home office work uh, was a way to, to keep your business um, running uh, while uh, work was actually um, was actually uh, safe. And there was also a great willingness of workers to switch into the uh, home office, at least uh, temporarily. Um, in August 2020, there was an estimate that in Great Britain, Spain, Italy, Germany, or France, only 50% of the employees uh, spend every day in the office and the rest enjoyed at least some, some um, home office uh, during, during the week. Um, if you want uh, kind of a, a prediction of, of how this trend is, uh, what will go on, I, I guess that um, uh, it depends on the speed with which we uh, we get rid of uh, the COVID-19 impediments. Um, but suppose that this uh, pandemic can be overcome, then I think that also some of the advantages of regular office work will resurface and become more important. And also some of the disadvantages of the home office will uh, gain weight again in the discussion. So I would expect that um, um, the pandemic's uh, most profound labor market legacy will probably be a rise in remote work. But once the pandemic is over, I think at least the speech at, at which uh, the trends towards home um, home office work, um, this speed will um, will slow down and will be partly reversed. Wonderful. And um, and one of us, uh, I think that we have some comments from a uh, question. I think, Gregory, we're answering one of your questions now. What does the future of work look like? And the other question is, what about those who are not knowledge workers? Uh, so uh, you could, whoever answers next, uh, maybe you can address that and still make your prediction for three and 20 years in the future. Who would like to go next? I'll try. So in three years, I see in, in a place like Ghana, more people like the young man that I spoke about, David, displacing expatriate workers because especially during COVID, a lot of expats moved out and people naturally had to fill their their shoes if if we could not connect by internet. So I see more more people who more younger people being promoted to work over here. In three to ten years I see infrastructure being built up because we're still very weak on broadband infrastructure and stuff like that but the government everybody was out of school for about four months so government had to figure a way with the tel the telecom providers to start putting and basically using mobile phones for schooling so that whole infrastructure, there's, there's going to be a priority on moving that infrastructure. Also, the government, even pre-COVID, experimented with a delivery of things like blood supplies, medicines in remote places with drones. So we're seeing drone stations uh, in remote parts of the country and kind of being coordinated. There's talk of a drone licensing and, and a drone airways path, all that kind of stuff. And the thing that I see three, 10, 20 years is really the impact on money or mobile banking. Already Africa is the leader in mobile money transactions, but in this pandemic period, all of us, upgraded our phones, those who could, to smartphones just to, and you're finding that plumbers, cleaners, basic even grocery sellers are transacting on smartphones. So 
I see that 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 is the big trend that will kind of even pull other things with it. So the, the question of even um, to the un, the question of what is happening with even those who are not skilled, at least everybody will get skilled in using mobile phones. And, and through that, they will start learning courses on and increase their access to education via the phone. That's, that's where I see things in my part of the world. Heidi, unmute yourself. Heidi, no point on talking with mute. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, it's it, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting um, when you got mobile and drones and all of those are a lot of the topics that the young people um, during the the pandemic uh, early days. Uh, we brought a group of young people between the ages of uh, eleven and twenty seven. Um, as in a fellowship class, we called the reverse pandemic rapid response team. And they were innovating and, and created a hackathon this summer and innovating on how, how we could solve problems around the pandemic, both economically, uh, medically, mental health, all these different. And a lot of the uh, innovations they had had to do with drones and mobile phones. So, uh, there's something, there's really something there, especially thinking about uh, being nimble, right, and and leaping over um, ba um, barriers of infrastructure and going straight to mobile to the people is very powerful. Um, and so, Luca, I would love to hear what you have to say about the future of work three years and 20 years in the future. Well, I think that uh, what will happen in 20 years, we have to plan it in three years. And to be able to do so, we should step out a bit from the rhetoric that says that everything in 20 years will be digital. Because uh, we have to be aware that 70% uh, of our economy is not digital at all and will never be digital. You cannot uh, produce goods in a factory uh, uh, with drones. You cannot uh, uh, harvest uh, uh, food in the countryside uh, uh, from home. Uh, and you cannot uh, uh, serve someone in a restaurant with a drone or from home. So it's clear that uh, if we want uh, to design an inclusive and sustainable future of work in 20 years, uh, we have to deal with uh, uh, hard economic sectors in transformation in the next three years. And this means that uh, we need to invest a lot of money, public and private money, to make uh, industries, agriculture and whatever services sustainable in environmental terms, uh, but also uh, more digital for sure, but at the same time more effective in a way that people can continue working in these activities. Uh, and uh, if jobs are going to be destroyed, many other jobs and possibly more quality jobs can be created in the same sectors in a way that people can uh, face uh, a decent and just and inclusive transition. This implies, as I say, massive economic, public and private investment. This implies a lot of uh, new technologies and innovation to be included in this investment. This implies for sure upskilling and reskilling people and making sure that uh, the social protection systems can accompany these uh, transformations. And the other element is that for sure there will be more digital economy. Uh, and we have to make sure that people that uh, work in the digital economy that are already, as I said, very high level skilled, uh, they can enjoy a decent living. They can have a decent income uh, to cope and make a living. They have also the possibility to be protected. And we can also ensure, as it was said by others, uh, uh, decent digital infrastructures uh, in a way that everybody can have access to digital infrastructures uh, data, personal data can be protected, and also mental safety conditions for digital workers can be ensured. These are the big challenges from my, from my point of view to be addressed in the next three years to make sure that in 20 years uh, we can have a better future of work. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, there, I see some interesting questions over there on the right, so I think uh, it might be uh, interesting to uh, address them. One is about I think we had, might have addressed, um, Ananda asked, do you think there will be nine to five work in the future and why? 
Will there be more small and flat organizations, rather large and hierarchical ones? So who would like to take that? So that's already happening. You know, the thing is, uh, we are all working for the last nine months from home and being even more productive than before. You know, lunch is free or, you know, doesn't cost me, doesn't waste time. And just because of the digital, the way we're connected on Zoom and Slack, we are being effective. But the interesting point, second point Ananda make is very important. The whole middle management will go away, which employs millions of people. Why do we need middle management? Middle management job was to take the instruction from the top management, translate them to the workers and collect what workers have done and report to the top management. There are software tools available now which can do that much better than a middle management. And the software tools also don't complain and don't cost as much. So this is a huge transformation. The middle management by and large will disappear. We are not even close to being ready for that. We are training MBAs every day to take middle management jobs. Good point, Nanda. That's a really good point. Thank you. I, I think that was a really, it, it, that just really, you know, landed for me. Um, and when thinking about how the corporate structure is going to change, uh, I know there's a lot of research about uh, middle management, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of redundancy in a lot of business processes that um, spend probably too much money. Um, and there can be more sustainable supply chains using tech as well. Uh, someone else asked, how do you, okay, I think I'm going to go can ahead. I, we have can, can I, can I just, just a second, uh, reply to this yeah. question with some, a couple of other questions. So are we really convinced that we have to move from nine to five? And on the contrary, there is any possibility that we can replace the four jobs that are going to be destroyed with new jobs, uh, maybe more innovative uh, and even better paid and even better valued. This is a question we should try to give an answer, because if the, our destiny, our future is simply that we are going to move from nine to five, then are we sure that minimum income schemes uh, can really fill the gap? And who is going to pay for that if we don't generate new jobs and new activities uh, to fill the gap? Uh, I mean, this this kind of scenario, if we don't make an effort to imagine new jobs that will replace the old ones, uh, the scenario that the number of jobs will be simply reduced or the working time will be cut by half uh, and the gap will be filled by public income schemes, uh, well, this scenario means that uh, our uh, uh, economic and social models will become totally unsustainable in the long run. I think we should not design this kind of future for our people. We should try to build an alternative. Yes. Wonderful. So I think let's go ahead and there's two there's two remaining topics on the right. And I think I would like to this last we have uh, a little under a little under 15 minutes left. So we get to go uh, deeper. And I think this is something that came up with all of you and is being asked on the right um, and uh, is about the young people, uh, the crisis that is happening right now. And, um, you know, we can look at you know, the young people who are struggling with online schooling um, and um, isolation, um, mental health, emotional health, um, a lot of uh, challenges, domestic violence with everybody in the house together in some situations. Uh, there is a very high rate of depressed uh, young people, especially in this country right now. Uh, twenty five percent of young people in this in the United States, uh, I happen to know, are considering suicide. So this is not a small thing. So we have this group of young people who are digital natives who have who those that have never had access to technology and even the most remote places you have a lot of them have mobile phones. Mobile phones is very, you know, uh, really distribute you know we've had a lot of distribution of mobile phones globally so with these young people having to do this online schooling with the content of the schooling being to serve the society that we pretty much no longer will have in a lot of ways there's a lot of training and there's a lot of trades and a lot of things that can be trained um, in order to create the future human-based digital economy. And the young people are sitting in these situations that are really not 
um, my son who came running in here uh, and didn't realize that he was in camera uh, says to me that he feels when he's sitting on online school, the more time he spends on Zoom listening to all this, this old content, trying to be forced, the less brain cells he has. That's what he told me. He said, I'm losing brain cells, mom, from doing online school. Um, and then on the other hand, on a side project this summer, he designed a virtual world um, in virtual reality, which is where he wants to go learn. Um, and he wants to learn in virtual reality. He said, why can't we have classrooms in virtual reality? And there are a lot of platforms that you can actually do this on mobile without the actual virtual reality glasses. So, so that's something that, um, here at Dream Tank, we're innovating for. But I want to hear, um, because I see the pain and I've talked to so many parents. So it's both the pain of the youth right now, the situation, and then the future of work. And how can we turn this challenging time into an operate into a an opportunity for young people right now? How can we serve them better in your opinions? Heidi, can I say yeah. something or um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, um, um, I, I have a daughter of 13 years. She probably goes to similar experiences as uh, your boy. Um, I, I think, first of all, hopefully, I mean, this is just a temporary uh, experience for, for the school kids. And at the beginning, it may be quite, uh, quite frustrating. As I mentioned, I mean, this online teaching is, is second best relative to in-person in person teaching, though I also realized at least, and now I'm giving a, a kind of a, a personal statement that my daughter learned quite a bit. Oh, in front of a computer, oh, no. reading text. Oh, and I mean, there's Wait. also some, there's also something, something positive to, to that experience, but I still believe it's, it's second best. And, um, uh, if the alternative is that uh, schools have to shut down like universities, that is of course the, the worst case. So, I, I, I guess we, we should get by and, um, you know, um, have the seminar and encourage our, our kids to, uh, to make the best out of this, out of this situation. Uh, in more general terms, with respect to the, the future and education of, of the young, um, one of the things that is, is important and, um, hopefully helps solving, uh, some of the problems that Naive hinted at, um, is that we have to prepare, uh, students that the, truly young pupils, right, or, or students later, um, to cope with change. Um, I think to some extent th that means at least for those uh, students who, who are ready to, um, uh, to, to, to learn this, I mean, to go for more abstract problem-solving capacities rather than to, uh, to specialize too early on a certain trait, which you then may at uh, 19 or 21, you really know all the facets by heart. And five years later, you realize that 80, 90% of the human capital that you have acquired on this one trait um, is completely depreciated because the trait no longer exists or it has changed uh, to a very large Extend so I think the 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 the, the thinking about um, educational contents is essentially a thinking about curricula and what should be to prepare our kids for a world um, of change and more intense, more frequent change than uh, than uh, probably we have experienced in our lifetime. So Heidi, if I can add to what said was, I think the future of education, especially higher education, is completely going to change. You right. know, Abraham Lincoln did not go to law school. How did he become a lawyer? Idea is that you, it is the future of education is stackable nano degrees and apprenticeship. You'll do several small specialties when you become good at some aspect, which is unique, and then you have apprenticeship. That's what a $50,000 a year, four year college will be replaced by because that is the unsustainable model. So this is going to have profound implication. Profound. So, yeah. Yes. So, you just said something that feels very true, but I know is rocking a lot of educators to their core. Uh, but it's good. You have, we have to make statements like this because it's, it's true. I feel the truth of that right now. I see that. 
in my in especially being a parent and an, and a coach of young people with entrepreneurship. Keep going. May I add, may I add something about uh, the worker's perspective when it comes to the problems that you were underlining? Uh, and it's the fact yeah. that uh, during the lockdown uh, in Europe, but I suppose the situation is very similar in other continents, uh, what we have seen raising among workers was uh, mental health problems, uh, suicides, uh, divorces, uh, and uh, even physical illness in some cases when people were obliged to work from home only. So we have a problem here to find the right balance when and finally this uh, pandemic uh, will stop or will go down a bit uh, and is at least to find ways to alternate between work from home and work from the workplace uh, because otherwise the social and uh, mental, uh, uh, mental uh, health dimensions uh, will be completely destroyed and disrupted by this situation. So there is really a need to rethink uh, the world of work, the workplace, even if this workplace is at home, uh, to make the whole thing more sustainable, to find the balance between private life, work, uh, work from home, work from the, the office or from the workplace. Uh, and this is really something we never explored in the past because we never faced a situation like the one we are in now. And this really needs uh, some analysis, but also concrete action to be put in place to protect people uh, from these really dangerous consequences. Thank you. And Ruben, do you have a, any other comments about, so Ruben, I mean, I don't know if you've done much uh, in, in Ghana, um, in West Ghana around more mentoring. Uh, I, maybe you just mentored this one, this one young man, but uh, what do you see is the future of work uh, around education? that could be implemented uh, in West Ghana. We have two minutes and 58 seconds. I think they're gonna literally turn us off. So so we have to, Ruben, uh, you have 30 seconds. So, to say so quickly, <clears throat> to say that Africa is the future because we have more than 50% youth there, adopting technology faster than most places. And so just the future is unknown, but very exciting. Wonderful. So <clears throat> let's wrap up. We have two minutes, 21 seconds. So I like what you said. I think we should all make a statement uh, that we hope will come true as if we remember uh, maybe a year from now, three years from now, we'll be at Harass, we'll be at Harassus together and we'll remember this moment when we made these statements because they came true. So I will, my future statement is that everyone in the future will be able to do something that brings love and joy in their hearts, that they can be expressed and that solves a problem in the world, and that they make money. And I think that future starts with uh, with entrepreneurship and innovation and design thinking now globally. So next, uh, who's, who's next to make your statement? We have one minute Well, yeah, I mean, um, I hope that the future of work will be such that all workers, not only the white collar and well-educated as we are, but uh, all workers in all professions can benefit from it. So my statement is the future is something that Luca said. Uh, if you can, uh, Ruben, you can mute yourself. I'll appreciate it. So what Luca said is, is, is right on. We are going back to the world when we're going to be living in tribes, smaller units, de-urbanization of big cities, because we'll be working about 20 to 25 hours a week and still be able to generate income and not have to have the tax of living in a big city. So I see a societal shift and change. Wonderful. Okay, we have 30 seconds. So last statement, anyone anyone want to make their last statement that have 30 seconds left? Yep. Can I say that I fully agree with what Andrea said, and I will add that we should manage these big changes together in a spirit of solidarity, having always the human being and the well-being of the people as the fundamental aim we, have, we should aim at. Wonderful. And Ruben, you just said it. You said the future 
is bright and it's unknown and exciting. So with that, thank you everyone and have a great day. Uh, oh, they didn't cut us off so I can actually just wrap up 10 more seconds and just say, let's put humans at the center and the planet at the center of the future of work. And let's make a commitment together to help each other and do the same. Are we, are you all with me? And everyone yes, here, everyone That's here, fantastic. yeah, everyone very good. Here, make a little Thanks. comment on the right if you Thank are you. committed to bringing humans to the center and the planet of the future of work. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And I will hopefully see you on some other sessions. Thank you, panelists. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. I don't.